like that. Um, but uh, folks, we're here just to, you know, basically answer some questions and just share with you what's going on. Um, let me ask some questions here just real quick. Sir, what do you think the assessor's office does? Uh, assessor's tax is on property, so it generates income for other services. Okay. So it basically, assessor's tax is on property, so it generate, generates an income for services where taxes go to the different entities like school districts, uh, fire districts, uh, county, and you know, city car police, city car streets, absolutely. Ma'am, how about you? What do you think the assessor does? Well, I think ultimately you do the math. You take what the values have been set at, you take the market, you do the math, you produce the sell, and you send it to us. I take off my shoes, count phalanges, and do all that. Absolutely. Um, so you know, just basically, as far as doing the doing the math and just you know uh, making the market adjustments here in El Paso County. Um, go over here, sir. How do you think the market is here in El Paso County right now? Very favorable if you're a homeowner. If you're a seller. If you're a seller. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. if, if you are a seller, I would agree with that. Man, you're a realtor. What do you think the market is right now? It's crazy. You know, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We're still getting multiple offers. Four hundred thousand going on in a couple days. It's a absolutely. Good market. It, it, it is a good market. Um, you know, my wife and I have had the discussion. Kendra and I have had the discussion of going. We got a lot of equity. Should we sell? But the, the conversation is, where would you go? You know, many in the real estate community will share with you today is we got a major supply and demand issue going on. And we'll discuss a little bit about that. Um, you know, when I go around and I talk to folks, you know, what the assessor's office does, the fourth function of your assessor's office is to discover, list, classify, and value all taxable and exempt property within their county. The other thing is when you sit there and you talk about, define or, you know, basically explain what the market is here in El Paso County, I've heard the terms, it's hot, it's red hot, it's nuclear, you know, just a lot of things that are going on. We have not seen a market like this in El Paso County in quite some time. And it's just not only El Paso County. Uh, we're seeing it in Teller County, our neighbors Douglas, you know, right along the front range. And what has been happening in Denver and Douglas County is also being attributable to some of the things that we're seeing here, where folks are now house poor, tax poor, and they're moving from Denver and Douglas County and moving into El Paso County. Anybody here from Monument, Palmer Lake? How much building are you guys seeing up there? How much growth? Bunch. A bunch. Absolutely. Uh, my wife's the dean of students up there at Palmer Ridge. She's seeing the kids that are coming in. And it basically is a lot of folks, like I said, that are house poor, tax poor, in Denver and Douglas County. And they're moving here, getting more home for less money and less taxes. And that's basically what's causing the crunch. But my goal tonight, what I want to talk to you about is the El Paso County real estate market update and trends. And we'll talk a little bit going, Steve, why are you talking 2016 and 2018? And I'll share that with you why. And then answer common questions that come into our office all the time. Why do we have property assessments? How and when is my property assessed? You know, how often do we go through this? How are my property taxes calculated? Keep in mind, it's the county treasurer's office that basically calculate the taxes and send the tax bill out. But I will sit there and guide you through and explain to you how to go about calculating your taxes. And then what I'm also going to be putting on your notice of value uh, that I'm going to be mailing out here on Wednesday, which come Wednesday, I'm probably going to be the most popular guy in the county and under my desk in a fetal position. So another question is, why did my property value go up? when I have not made any changes. I didn't make any additions, I didn't do any upgrades, I didn't do any demos, but why is my value going up? Why the value change? We hear that quite a bit. If there's a value change, are my property taxes going to go up? And you know what, we all like to see our number one retirement asset appreciate and not what happened back in 2007, 8, 9, where we lost a lot of value in our, in our asset. We like to see the appreciation but we don't like to see our county assessor sharing that with us because there's, we know there's taxes associated with that. So we'll discuss that as well. We'll discuss the 2019 notice of value because I'm changing that up. I am actually gonna be including an estimated tax table on there because you know what? I too wanna know what the bottom line is. If my value goes up by X, 
what is the bottom line? What are my taxes going to be? And why are they still considered estimated? How can I appeal my property value? I understand not everybody agrees with their assessor, so we'll sit there and talk about how you can go about appealing your property value. And then let's open it up for questions and have some dialogue and things like that. So, just, so here in El Paso County in 2016-2018, I've been going around the community and sharing with folks we have been in the top 10 market, not in the state of Colorado, in the whole entire nation for the past three to four years. Um, how many have lived here more than 20 years? Wow, a lot of us. Um, I'm gonna date myself, but I will share with you guys, the year I graduated high school is the year Chapel Hills Mall opened up. <laughs> so it now is Chapel, no one's, you know, it looks like Chapel Hills Mall is becoming, you know, a blank store, you know, a blank building. Um, but I will tell you this is things have dramatically <coughs> changed in this community since I was a kid growing up here in 1975. I remember coming over Monument Hill every weekend. I visit my great grandmother um, in downtown Denver. And, you know, I remember seeing a sign, Welcome to Colorado Springs, population 118,000. Those days are long gone. And, you know what, folks that have been here with me, the secret's out. We've known this for years. We live in a great community. Um, you know, going outside, it's great weather, you know, the parks, the trails, the open space. We live in a great community and the secret is out where we have a number of individuals moving in. Um, we've been identified as the number one place for millennials to come to. Uh, retirees are coming to, coming to. Folks from Denver, Douglas County are coming to El Paso County. In fact, I actually went to an economic uh, forum um, this morning down at the Cheyenne Mountain Conference Resort and they are predicting we are going to be growing, El Paso County is going to be growing by half a million people in the next 10 years. And it, it, again, just the secret is out of what's going on. But as you see here, it should be no secret to any of us as property owners. We see it on the national news. We're seeing it in Rich Layton's, you know, the Gazette Telegraph every Sunday. We're seeing it on the local media. The housing momentum in Colorado moves down the front range. As you see here, Elbert, Orefano, Pueblo, Teller counties, along with El Paso, rank on the top for market acceleration, according to Denver Post. So what has happened in Denver four, six years ago, and I knew this was going to happen because I've been in, this, been in this industry for a very long time, it takes about four years for that to roll on over Monument Hill. Um, there are concerns I have with this type of market, and part of it is affordable housing. When you're sitting here talking about what is really affordable now, when our median home price in El Paso County has now surpassed three hundred thousand dollars, to me that's not affordable. As you see here, Rich Lane, Colorado Springs ranks number six among the nation's hottest housing markets for number, uh, November. That headline has not changed in the last three years. We consistently have been in the top ten in the entire nation for the last three to four years. Um, as you see, Colorado Springs came in number six at Realtors.com, top 20 housing markets nationwide, a ranking that has remained unchanged from October, and like I said, it's consistently doing that. Here's some of our local media. KKTV, Colorado Springs housing market will remain strong in 2019. It has not slowed down. Um, the number of deeds that my staff are working right now are between 125 to 150 deeds a day which is a significant amount of transactions that are happening here in El Paso County. So it has not slowed down. The Gazette, more homes for sale as Colorado Springs housing market changes. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of construction here in the county. Um, are you guys aware just about a year ago, the state changed its, uh, the state bird? It's now the construction crane? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> Dry humor, but you know, I thought that'd be all right. <laughs> so I thought it guys. But you know, guys, we're seeing the construction cranes, you know, we're seeing a lot of construction going on, um, new subdivisions, and you know what? I have not seen as many plats in my 21 years in the assessor's office, I have seen more plats come across my desk in the last three years than I have seen in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, just a lot of things going on. Uh, KOAA, booming real estate market continues in El Paso County. Business Journal, report shows increased housing prices in Colorado Springs. News 13, Colorado Springs named eighth best uh, housing market in the nation for 2018. So you guys are seeing what is coming up here. This is the reason why I felt it necessary 
to come out and talk to the property owners of El Paso County um, just to basically hopefully reduce a little bit of the sticker shock that we're all going to see when we see the notice of value they're going to be mailed out next week. So the first thing is why do we have property assessments? And the gentleman over here uh, shared with me and he hit it right on was first the Constitution and state laws of Colorado dictate all 64 county assessors have to reassess, reappraise <coughs> their county all of their taxable and exempt properties every odd year. So every odd year in the state of Colorado is what we call a reappraisal year and of course 2019 is just that. So the values determined by the assessor's office for real and personal property, does anybody know what personal property is? So back in the day, absolutely. So um, the state of Colorado used to value jewelry, dishes, your animals, you know, things like that. And that was back in the early 1900s. In fact, when we moved from downtown to um, Guard of the Gods, we found some very old abstracts from the early 1900s. And I had to laugh when I was going through them. Because at that time it said, you know, we valued total. There was 1,500 jackasses in El Paso County. I'm going, there's a lot more now. <laughs> so, so we multiplied there. Um, but when, what personal property is, it's business personal property. So our businesses are taxed on their equipment, their furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And so, you know, I, I feel that's an onerous tax because our business owners are paying a sales tax, a use tax, and they also file that on their Schedule C for depreciation to the IRS. In fact, it's so confusing is our business owners have to keep a separate book for the state of Colorado than they do the feds because the depreciation schedule is completely different. Um, so the good news is El Paso County is the only county in the state where the city and the county, the monies that are supposed to come in from the business equipment are given back to those business owners as a business tax credit but we still have to vet, discover it, list it, value it uh, for the school districts, fire districts, and things like that, but the city and county give that back as a business tax. So, as you see here, um, the values determined by the assessor's office for real and personal property are used in the calculation of property tax bills that are mailed by our county treasurer's office. Keep in mind, these are two totally separate offices, two totally different elected offices, and I think when Colorado established itself back in 1876, they did it the right way because some states actually their assessor is the tax collector. So you got one person doing the valuing and the collecting. Here in the state of Colorado is two totally separate entities so you have s several eyes looking at that ensuring there's no hanky-panky of you know basically valuing and then collecting the taxes. The revenue raised through these property taxes is used to help pay for all public services which we know Police, schools, libraries, fire protection, city, county, things like that. So, how is my property assessed? So for residential property, county, uh, county assessor or appraisers study the sales of homes similar to your, yours which sold within a specific 24 month time frame. This is extremely important. So for the 2019 reappraisal, by law, we can only use sales that occurred from July 1 of 2016 to June 30th of 2018. This is extremely confusing to property owners who are going, Steve, I just got this NOV and you're saying my value is this. But you're using data that's a year, year and a half, almost two years old. And that's done, basically done by state law. Here is where this could really kill an assessor's office. When you see an appreciating market like we're in, it's not that big of a deal. But in 2009, we got crucified and the reason why is we went, basically the, the housing market crashed, we saw a lot of foreclosures, but our NOV still showed values going up. And we had a number of people outside our office going, do you guys know exactly what you're doing? But it comes down to the 24 month time frame. so you keep in mind is for the 2019 reappraisal, it's the sales that occurred from July 1 of 2016 to June 30th of 2018. And so as an appraiser, and those folks that are in the real estate market, they know is there's three components to valuing a property. You could use the cost, market, or income approach. So here, why am I only using sales for residential property and not the cost and income approach? Anybody have an idea? Tabor. 
When we as voters voted in Tabor back in 1992, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, part of that amendment said assessors can only use the sales market comparison approach for single family residential property. Now, we can use all three approaches for non-residential, which is commercial and vacant land and business personal property, which is cost, market, and income. This was a huge shift in the assessor's office, especially when you're sitting there looking at rental properties. And when somebody's like, I only had a renter in there for three months, we can no longer sit there and look at that information. We have to use the sales market comparison approach, part of the Tabor Amendment. So as mentioned, for commercial and industrial properties, we use the cost market income, income approaches and are considered for business personal property. Those values are based on um, assets that are provided to us uh, via their declaration schedules that they just submitted to my office on April 15th. So when is my property assessed? I just mentioned that you know five minutes ago. Every odd year in the state of Colorado is a reappraisal year. And so under Colorado law, all real property, land, buildings, improvements must be reappraised every two years, and this occurs every odd number year, 2017, 2019. And believe it or not, folks, we haven't even mailed out the notice of value, and my staff is already working on the 2021 reappraisal because of the sales that are currently going on. We are audited on those sales, so every deed that comes in, we are already reviewing those sales to make sure they're arm's length transaction. So the assessor's office studies those sales of properties, and as I said, we're audited on that which is a good thing, which sold during the 24-month study period, um, ending June 30th of the year prior to the reappraisal. New values are set each year for business personal property owned by businesses based on information. So um, business personal property and state assessed. So we actually have state assessed property, which is our airlines. Uh, we tax the, every rail car that comes down through El Paso County, uh, telecommunications, the wind turbines out in Calpan, the transmission lines, all that is considered state assessed and we value that every year. So, how are my property taxes calculated? First and foremost is, again, the assessor does not set the property taxes or collect payments. However, I am more than happy to provide the information and guide you through this. So to calculate the taxes, first and foremost, how many people here feel that they are taxed on the, their actual market value? Got one. Usually it's a whole hand that goes up. We are not taxed on our actual market value. We are actually taxed on our assessed value. And we'll go into a little bit about that, of how the two constitutional amendments are colliding with one another, which is the Gallagher Amendment and the Tabor Amendment. So to calculate the taxes, the assessor actual value is adjusted by the appropriate assessment rate to determine its assessed value. So non-residential property owners, commercial, vacant land, their assessment rate is 29%. For single family residential property, it's 7.2. So the commercial and vacant land properties owners are paying quadruple the amount of taxes. When you sit there and you take a look at the difference between 7.2 and then 29%. So let's talk a little bit about the Gallagher Amendment. Anybody have heard, has seen in the news or read in the paper the Gallagher Amendment? Okay, a couple. All right, guys, when you're done with this, everybody's going to get a certificate of finishing Assessor 101 here real quick. But this is extremely important. Back in 1982, the state of Colorado was going basically through a tax revolt. The assessment rate for non-residential and residential properties was 30%. And back in 1982, for those of us that you know have been here quite some time, we were in a very hot market at that time as well. And what has happened is folks were being pushed out of their homes, values were going up, they could no longer afford the taxes when you had an assessment rate of 30%. So, in, in no exaggeration or embellishment, people were actually putting keys under their doors and basically just walking away and doing, you know, going through the foreclosure process. So Senator Dennis Gallagher said, you know what, I see po folks up here, they're lobbying for the farmers, the ranchers, ag land, there's lobbyists up here for developers, there's lobbyists up here for you know commercial property owners. I'm not seeing lobbyists for the residential property owners. And what bothered him, it was in his neighborhood up in Denver where he saw a lot of seniors not able to sit there and pay their taxes. And their properties were going into tax sale, foreclosure, and things like that. So what he proposed was the, the Gallagher Amendment, which is also known as the 55-45 split. 55% of property taxes paid in through the state 
are paid in by non-residential property owners, commercial vacant land. 45% are paid in by residential property owners. Every year, all 64 county assessors have to submit their sale data to the Division of Property Taxation to be you know, reviewed and audited to look at if we need to, need to make adjustments to the residential rate to get us to that 45%. What has happened is, since we're in a very hot market, is our residential assessment rate four years ago was 7.96%. It dropped down to 7.2%, and the reason for that is because our residential values were going up, and they had to reduce the assessment rate to bring us down to 45%. A preliminary study for tax year 2019 and 2020 had us dropping the rate from 7.2 uh, to 6.95%. The final study came out last Monday. It is now running its way through um, the legislature, and it'll probably get on the governor's desk here in the next week but the final rate is 7.15%, which is a full 1% reduction from 7.2. This is extremely important when we figure out um, the estimated taxes. So this is where the Gallagher Amendment comes in. So here is the conflict between Gallagher and Tabor. You do not need the vote of the people to reduce the residential assessment rate. However, during the recession, that assessment rate per the Gallagher Amendment was supposed to raise to about 9% because we lost a lot of value in our property. The reason it did not do that is because now Tabor, which was voted in 10 years after Gallagher, that is now considered a tax increase. So Gallagher it cannot do what it was intended to do in 1982. So now you've got two constitutional amendments that are butting heads with one another. And so this has basically become a huge discussion item up there. Mm. Uh, in fact, they actually put a committee together with some House District representatives, some senators, and six assessors where we are sitting here just coming up with ideas to take to the voters. And thankfully, I was one of the assessors to you know, basically sit on that table, because I feel El Paso County needs to have to sit on the uh, seat at the table on this, because it's a very important topic when it comes to our, our property taxes and the assessment rate. So, the assessed value, let less any exempted amount, is next multiplied by the applicable tax rate, our millings. You know, many folks up here are paying into School District 20, City of Colorado Springs, El Paso County, things like that. So those are the entities that are drawing property taxes, um, and those are called millings. So in Colorado, tax rates are expressed as a decimal fraction of a dollar for every one dollar of assessed value known as a millage or mills. So I put some examples here together for you. So in 2018, El Paso County's average mill rate is 75 mills. In 2018, the median price or midpoint of a single family uh, residential home is valued at about $305,000. Again, I can't believe that's what we're talking about. The median value of a home here in El Paso County is now over $300,000. Yeah, I would have to say that. So if you look at the formula of actual value times the assessment rate, times the mill rate gives you your estimated taxes. So let's take it, the actual value of $305,000 home at today's assessment rate of 7.2%. You multiply those two, you get an assessed value of $21,960. That is what you're gonna be taxed on. You take that times the mill levy of 75 mills, the estimated taxes are 1,647. Let's go through and see how the assessment rate and the mill levies impact our taxes. So let's just go ahead and change the assessment rate. The value stays constant. The assessment rate drops from 7.2 to 7.1. You see the reduction in the assessed value from 21,960 to 21,810. So you're seeing a reduction of $11.25 in taxes just on that property. But since 2019 is a reappraisal, Let's say based on sales, I increase the value of that property by 15%. So today's value is 350,750. Assessment rate is 7.15%. You're looking at a difference of $234, um, you know, based on that. But the impact of the assessment rate and also your mill levies is extremely critical in, in determining uh, what your estimated taxes are. So. We talked about the assessment rate. A lot of folks are sitting here talking, all right, Steve, what about our districts? Many of our districts here in El Paso County have to comply with TABOR. 
And when you're looking at the value increases that we are seeing, is some of these districts are probably going to have to ratchet down. Has anybody ever heard that term, a ratchet down effect? They're going to have to ratchet down their mill levies to get below their Tabor cap. So we don't know what the taxes for our properties are going to be until mid-December when they have to submit their levies to us. By law, on August 25th, I have to send out uh, preliminary certifications to all, over 300 taxing districts here in El Paso County, letting them know here is what your total assessed value is for residential, non-residential, and exempt property. And that's where they base the calculations off what their mill levy is going to be. And when you're looking at increasing the assessed value total countywide by 15%, some of these districts are going to have to lower their mill levies to sit there and bring things down, which means our taxes will probably be coming down if they have to reduce their mill levies. So, is there any questions on that? Did I confuse folks? Because everybody looks like, oh, Steve. Yeah. It's confusing. One hand you said they're going to go up, and then another hand you said they're going to You know, it, and I'm not going to sugarcoat things. You know, when you're looking at the value increases that we're seeing based on the sales, our taxes are going to go up. But they're completely estimated until mid, uh, middle December. But, you know, the worst case scenario is probably what you're going to see on the estimated tax box that I'm going to provide on the NLB. There's a lot of things that are going to come into play. Yes, sir. If I understand you correctly. If, if uh, uh, the school district has a, a little levy, of, and I'm making this up obviously, for five, they can't collect any more than they were collecting before, and therefore they have to reduce their mill levy? So, on the school districts, and I wish their mill levy was five. <laughs> so, um, to answer your question, is if they have a mill levy override, you know, where the voters came in and basically said, hey, we're going to go ahead and get bonds, and basically these taxes are going to go back to pay the bonds, that's not affected. It's basically their straight mill levy. They're only allowed to basically, per growth, per Tabor, is a half of 5.5% growth. And if they're above that 5.5%, they have to reduce their levy. Uh, I would not be surprised is in the upcoming election, some of our districts may be coming to us and asking to sit there and basically, you know, keep their mill levy where it's at or increase the mill levy or basically keep the Tabor refund because they may over collect and they may come to the voters within that district to, you know, see if they can keep the Tabor refund. Steve, I want to throw in a little bit about that that Tabor is the downward pressure on the revenue that municipalities and active districts can collect in sheer dollar amounts based on basically inflation. So as your assessed values are going up, mill no levies are staying, they're bumping up and over that Tabor limit. Now, they can't collect that much money, they have to bring that down to here. They have two options for that in reality. One is to reduce the tax levy but they don't want to do that because per Tabor, you have to put any future increases to a vote of the public. So these taxing entities are very, very, very reluctant to lower their mill levies because once they do, they're stuck there unless they get another vote of people to bring it back up and then times go down. So that's why they're always coming back to us with those Tabor exceptions to keep those holdovers because they don't want to have to lower that tax rate. Now, the other thing that that does is it puts some, and there's protections against it, but some downward pressure against the assessors to keep those, those assessed values lower during those hot markets so that the other government entities don't have to lower their real levies and go back to the voters. So that's you know something I'd like for, you know, if you could address that a little bit, is what kind of downward Abs pressure. Absolutely. So once we get through here, remind me of that one in okay. regards to, and to your question or statement in regards to the downward pressure. Okay. So if you guys can remember that real quick. Yes, sir. Did you say that you were going to send out uh, to, to all property owners an estimated tax, some kind of estimate in the near future? A absolutely. So Wednesday, this uh, not tomorrow, but May 1st, I am mailing out over 300,000 notices of value. So it's a love letter to you guys just to say hello. <laughs> um, you know, I send it with a lot of love. But it's, what it's going to show, and we'll talk about this as well, but it's going to show you basically what your uh, current value, past year value, current value, 2019 value, and the net change, 
and like I you know shared with you is at the bottom of the notice of value is I'm gonna put an estimated tax table so there's gonna be two rows on this table first row is your 2018 payable 2019 taxes then it's gonna have your estimated 2019 payable 2020 based on the value change because you know again I tune a property owner and when I open that thing up is hey great you're raising my value 20 25 percent but how's this going to impact my pocketbook? And I think all of us can be in agreement is that's what we're really looking at is how is this going to affect my escrow? If we are escrowing our taxes, how is this going to affect my monthly payment? You know, am I going to be getting a letter from Wells Fargo going, my monthly payment is going to be going up $50, you know, based on that. But yes, sir, I am going to be including an estimated tax table on that. And so that will include then the current mill levy values, not any new ones or not any new yes. ones. No, it would include the 2018 mill levy because we won't know what the 2019s are until December 15th. And that's the reason why it's an estimate. So why the value change? So in order to determine new values for residential property, including single family, multifamily, apartments, all 64 county assessors are required by law to use only the market approach, as I stated, uh, for 2019 property values. The sales prices of the homes, similar to yours, which sold in that 24-month time frame, so from July 1 of 2016 to June 30th of 2018. So those are the sales that we studied. Here in El Paso County, we nearly set a record. We had nearly 43,000 sales in that 24-month time frame. That is a lot of sales. That's a lot of transactions. There's a lot of data that we were looking at. And I'm going to be, you know, once we're done here, I'll share some data with you guys of the sales in particular neighborhoods here at Briargate. Because what I did is I basically did a circumference and I pulled neighborhoods. I pulled Briargate and a number of different neighborhoods that you all reside in. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So if the sale prices of these homes went up, then the assessed value of your home likely showed an increase. But again, your assessor does not determine the market. The market is determined by a willing buyer and a willing seller, you know, here in the county. And I tell you, some of us that have been in the real estate community and we were having this conversation is, here are some of the sales, I shouldn't say some, many of the sales that I'm seeing today and that I've seen occurred since 2016 through 2018. It is supply and demand, is we have very few, very few supply and a lot of pent up demand. A lot of folks have figured out the secret. They're moving here. Millennials are moving out of the basement of mom and dad's, thank goodness, and they're wanting to get into home ownership. Folks that were foreclosed on during the recession now have credit. They now have money to put a down payment on, and they want to you know, basically get out of renting and get back into property ownership. Um, but it, again, it's not your assessor that uh, basically dictates the market. The sales that we have been seeing coming in is people are getting into bidding wars. And you know, folks are sitting there saying, I'm gonna put my house on the market for $300,000. A seller will get into a bidding war with another seller, and they're going to the closing table with five, 10, 15, $20,000 in cash above asking price. And this has been going on for quite some time. Would you agree? Yeah, four years. Yeah, and, and those become arm's length transactions. And they're filed with the clerk and recorder but it's continually going on today. In fact, my neighbor just got an offer and there's a bidding war. He put his house on the market for $400,000 and I can't believe he was gonna get $400,000. He signed a contract today, they're coming to the closing table with $23,000 in cash. And, and, and this is what's happening here in our local real estate market. So, sir. How does it work if it was a vacant lot one of the years and you built the house the next year? I tell you what, if I can get through this, can I address that question? Sure. That is a really good question. So, will my property taxes go up? Guys, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Our taxes are going to go up. You know, I could wish to, you know, share with you that they're not, you know, don't worry about it, but I'm not going to sugarcoat this at all. My taxes are going up and just about everybody else in El Paso County, their taxes are going up as well. But, as I mentioned, keep in mind the residential assessment rate and the mill levies and the different amendments that are playing into this. So residential, non-residential assessment rates are uh, set by the state legislature. As I mentioned, it is now moving its way through the house and hopefully it will be on the governor's desk before their end of session and he'll sign that residential assessment rate at 7.15%. Mill rates, and again, I have nothing to do with mill rates, 
we as voters vote in school board members. We vote in city council members. We vote in board of county commissioners. It is those elected officials that sit on those boards that are responsible for the mill levies for the city of Colorado Springs, school district 20, school district 11, uh, El Paso County, and things like that. So it is not the, your assessor that sets the mill rates. The only thing that your assessor is responsible for is all the taxing entities send the information to me, I put in a report, I submit it to the Board of County Commissioners for approval, and then I send it up to the state. Now, a lot of times I get questions from property owners going, well, Steve, you're talking Tabor, you're talking mill levies. What if one of these districts violates the Tabor? They go above their Tabor cap. Well, believe it or not, the Board of County Commissioners and your uh, elected county assessor do not have police rights. So we cannot do anything about that. However, the State Board of Equalization can. They are the ones that can come down and impose penalties, you know, things like that, and make them change their mill levies or have to issue refunds back to the taxpayers. Thankfully, in El Paso County, we have not seen that. So it's, it's the State Board of Equalization. So as mentioned, oh, go back. Sorry. The mill rates are provided in mid-December from our local taxing entities, such as city, county, school district, fire district, library, and it is these elected taxing authority board members that determine the yearly mill levies for the following year budgets. And folks, I will tell you with the value increases, I have been getting calls daily from many of our taxing entities who are concerned that they're gonna have to go ahead and ratchet down their mill levies. So the 2019 notice of value, um, as stated, I'm mailing out over 300,000 NOVs to um, taxable and partial exempt property owners. I will tell you, I do not believe in mailing notices of value to complete exempt property owners. It is a complete waste of taxpayer money when you're looking at printing it and paying first class stamp and envelopes. These are entities that don't pay the taxes. So we're talking school districts, Fort Carson, Air Force Academy, churches, things like that. It's just a waste of taxpayer money to mail that off to them. So um, we don't mail notice of value off to exempt properties. The notice will contain the prior actual value, the current actual value, and the net change. And I'm also providing, as I mentioned to you, is the current year tax amounts along with an estimate of probable uh, 2019 property tax amounts payable in 2020. And again, keep in mind, these are an estimate because of mill levies cannot be determined until mid-December. And the notices will also state the applicable rate of assessment that will be on your notice of value, which right now is uh, projected to be 7.15%. Here's what the notice of value looks like. And the estimated tax rate will be right down here in this white area. But here you'll have all your information. But folks, this is a very important form. This is more important than, hey, okay, Steve, you're raising my value 20%, and here's what my estimated taxes are. You want to look at your property characteristics. This is your property record card, because you know what? We in the assessor's office are human. We may be taxing you for 500 more square feet than what you have, or we may have your bedroom count off, or your bathroom count off. But that's major information where you as a property owner should look at it and go, you know what, we bought this house three years ago, we have 3,300 square feet, but that assessor is, is valuing us at 3,700 square feet. Or they got us at a finished basement. We don't have a finished basement. This is extremely important. This is where you need to let us know that we are incorrect and we can make you know your property record correct as well. So that is another big reason for this. Now, as mentioned, the estimated tax table will be right down here. And if you were to appeal, this is a step-by-step -step form just to guide you of how to go about appealing your property value. And I will share with you how easy we have made it here in El Paso County. It will let you know you can appeal in person, over the phone, in mail, on a bar napkin. We still have two fax machines, um, you know, online, things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Thank you. So, appealing your property value. In the state of Colorado, and especially here in El Paso County, we as property owners have property rights. And you have the right to appear your property value if you believe it is incorrect. You, I don't know your property as well as you do. I don't know if you're in a landslide area. I, you know, well, I would now, you know, after what happened in Broadmoor Bluffs and Skyway and things like that. 
I don't know if you have a cracked foundation. I don't know if you still, you know, have hail damage or things like that. I don't know that. You as the property owner know your property better than your county assessor. So when you receive your notice of value, there will be instructions along with it explaining how you may submit an appeal either in writing, in person, online, fax, on bar napkin, whatever you need. So when appealing, please be sure to explain why you think your value is incorrect. Folks, sadly, we can't appeal our taxes. We appeal the value of the property, not the taxes. So we'd have to sit there and look at the value going, I don't agree with this value. And you know, share with us the reason why. And if you have some documentation, so let's say during the 24 month time frame, you refinanced and you had a fee appraisal done. That is really good information that we can use where my staff can sit there and make an informed decision of changing your value. Or if you sat there and you're basically looking at um, a cost of cure. Anybody familiar with that term, cost of cure? No? It became very prevalent in the Black Forest Fire. Just to share with you what we learned over time in Black Forest is we went in and did, did the damage assessment. And we made the value adjustments on the improvements that were destroyed. But we also realized that many of the folks moved up to Black Forest because they wanted to be in the trees. There was value in those trees and we found out for a five acre untreed lot was selling 30% less than a five acre treed lot. So we made a determination, we're not arborists, but we just made an, an opinion of value, is if the trees were destroyed on that property, we allowed for a 30% reduction of the land value back in 2013 when the fire happened. If they were damaged, we allowed for a 15% reduction. Six months after the fire, many of those property owners were bringing us bills of sale or insurance quotes. It was costing them $5,000 per acre to take down those uh, burnt sticks. And when you have a five acre parcel, that's $25,000, $30,000. That is a lot of money. So what we saw was happening is folks were selling the property at a reduced rate because they couldn't afford to take down those burnt trees. We're still seeing that today, where they're sitting there selling the property for $25,000, $40,000 less than what market is. The cost to cure is that number where it's gonna cost them $40,000 to bring it up to actual market value. What is it gonna to take to cure this property and bring it up to current market? So, on my website, what I'm extremely proud of is this year is the very first year all property owners in El Paso County can now go online <coughs> on a GIS platform, pull up your neighborhood, and look at the sales that occurred within that 24 month time frame. You can, on Citizen Comper, which stands for comparables and online appeals, you can go into your neighborhood and basically on your property and see all the sales going around. You can select those comps. And I actually build you a comp grid sheet for you to make an informed decision while you're sitting at your coffee table, you know, having a hot cup of coffee. But what I'm most proud about is this application, it basically has made my office 100% transparent. What you are seeing is exactly what my staff is seeing when we value your property. And that is now at, the, at your fingertips. And as you guys are looking at it, please feel free to go out there, test it, take a look at it. Um, if you're lost in it, call me. Um, I left business cards, but if you guys got pen and paper, my direct number is 520-6527. You can call me and I will guide you through that process, but a very, very easy process. Um, just a plug out there for those folks who work in this industry, I can also tell you that we, as real estate agents, and are willing to help walk through that too because we have access to the same day to different systems. So if it's overwhelming and confusing, call your real estate book. Everybody's got one in their back pocket, right? Yep. If you don't. Absolutely. <laughs> so the, the, the term copper stands for comparable. So if we comparable properties. Right. Okay. So it's it's a tab that you will see when you pull your property up and it's right below the map, you'll see it right there. Um, but like I said, if you get lost in it, just give me a call and I'll guide you there. <clears throat> now, here is the map. You know, and I know everybody's been looking at this online. We got a, a larger version, you know, um, over there on the wall. But I've been spending my time going through different areas of the county and talking to folks where we've been over on the west side, we've been on the southeast side. 
um, you know, up here in Briargate, you know, Central Colorado Springs, we're going out to Calhan next week to talk to those folks on what is happening out there. But as you see here, a lot of different value increases. And I wish this showed up a lot better, but as you can see on that map, the southeast side is seeing increases of 30 to 35 percent. And those are the neighborhoods of Valley High, East Borough, South Borough. Uh, you know, 20, 25 percent um, increases security wide field fountain. And, you know, when I went and spoke to those folks, they're like, oh my gosh, dude, what do you mean? It's like, why in the world 30, 35 percent? is why in the world are we going up so much? Well, there's good news and bad news. Is the bad news is it was the Southeast Corridor back in the recession where those are the property owners that saw the hardest, they were the hardest hit. There was actually a two-tier market during the recession in this area right here, where we actually saw more foreclosures than we did arm's length transactions back in 2007, eight, and nine. The good news is those property owners are now seeing their values back previous 2007. They now have some equity in their property, but the bad news is when the, the assessor's saying that, there's taxes associated with it. But as you move on up, you'll see the different value increases as we're going. And keep in mind, you know, again, it's based on the sales, and I'll share with you in the different neighborhoods the number of sales that have occurred. Because when you got 43,000 sales in a 24 month time frame, that is a lot of data. This is online. You can download this as a PDF. You can zoom in, take a look at what's going on. Um, I put this out on the media. I know that Pam Zubek with The Independent was kind enough. She put it out there. I know Rich Layden's uh, putting it out there, but you can go to my website and actually download it for your review as well. And there's a lot of good information in this table that will let you know the number of sales that occurred within that neighborhood. So, <laughs> questions so sir I know you had one and you're talking about if I remember the question correctly is vacant land that went residential am I correct mm -hmm. so the question was the change from a vacant parcel to a <coughs> residential parcel and probably I, I'm assuming your question is the difference in taxes mm -hmm. so on a vacant parcel that assessment rate is at 29% believe it or not because it's considered non-residential. So if you have a $300,000 vacant lot, it is multiplied by 29% to get your assessed value, then multiplied by the mill levy. Once you put the shovel in the dirt to pour a foundation, it goes from vacant land to a residential lot, which changes it from 29% to 7.15%. Your taxes went dramatically down. And this is where a lot of property owners, it, vice versa, it's like, you know, if you. You know, if you sit there and you change the property from residential to vacant land, it goes up. That was a concern for a lot of our property owners who lost their homes in the fires. Waldo Canyon, Black Forest. You know, 2015, we had the landslides, the Manitou floods. Folks, sadly, my office has gotten dang good at damage assessment. In fact, we actually teach the class a lot of times up at the state. It's nothing to brag about, so I hope this summer we have a little bit of moisture, no fires, and things like that. But what I did tell those property owners is in Black Forest is I am not changing their property value from residential to commercial and quadrupling their taxes when they're still trying to rebuild. So I've been keeping their rates at residential. But that's the reason why, sir, is the residential assessment, the commercial and the residential assessment rate. So I know there was a question here. We were talking, I forget. Earlier I'd, I'd asked you about Piece of it, and you address that. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. What percentage bell passes exempt? Nearly, I would say, over 20,000 parcels. Um, there's quite a bit. Yeah. You know, when you sit there and you look at the federal land, but keep in mind, though, El Paso County gets a pill. So do our school districts for federal land. Payment in lieu of taxes. So what we look at is Air Force Academy right across the street from us. We look at that, what would the value of that land be if it were developed? So we basically put commercial values, residential values on, on there, and the federal government pays the county and the school districts a payment in lieu of taxes. Same with uh, natural forest, national forest, things like that. Yes, ma'am. When it talks about looking at, uh, in terms of cons, um, 
homes that are similar to yours, what what constitutes similar? Because houses on a street can be vastly different. It's a very good question. Um, if I could answer that in two parts, okay? One of which is um, El Paso County is we are the largest <coughs> county in the state of Colorado population and also parcel size. As I alluded to, we have over 300,000 parcels. We're extremely large and we have the lowest number of appeals for any metro county in the state. And the reason for this, we have less than 1% of our property owners appeal. And I think that's attributable to we run two different types of reappraisals. One of which is we do it the old fashioned way. We derive the sales out of the neighborhood and we pull sales of similar properties and we make those value adjustments based on are the values going up or are they going down. We also run now a very statistical approach called multiple regression analysis, which contains a lot of different variables. Is it a one car garage, two car garage, three car garage, two, two fireplaces, just a number of known different variables. Um, where we have problems is Old Colorado City, Manitou, where each one of those properties, Old North End, each one of those properties are extremely unique from one another. They're not, you know, um, cookie cutter homes. So we have to go in and we make adjustments. Uh, making adjustments on, is it a three car garage, two car garage? What's the square footage? Is it a bi-level, tri-level? Is it a ranch? So we make those value adjustments. But with the new copper, what the old system did is it basically just pulled the sales up and what a lot of property owners did, they're like, oh, my value is at 300,000, but there's a sale for 175,000, but it wasn't a true comp. So if you had a rancher, they're picking buy levels and doing all kinds of stuff. So it was very confusing. Now you'll see this information. And I, Julie, you're awesome. Um, how you can't get into the Wi-Fi. Wi like um, the page doesn't so, load, so. Julie, you're awesome because she's going to go in where you can actually see where you can change the variables in Copper now. And you can sit there and make those adjustments based on the subject property. And hopefully, we can get into that. But I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, when you were talking about your GIS system, does it show the comps that you used for our taxes or do just the, the whatever the parameters for? things that we set like X number of bedrooms, garages, square feet, and pulls up the houses in that area it, for those parameters. So what it will provide you is all the sales within that neighborhood where you, as an informed property owner, can go in and say, okay, Steve's valued my property at this. Um, what are the sales going on that are comparable to my property? So you're gonna have all the sales available to you where you can see what's going on in your neighborhood. So you still have to choose based on your parameters? Absolutely. Okay. So, it, it, and again, is you can sit there and appeal that where you sit there and make an informed decision going, Steve's valued my pr uh, property at 400,000. This property over here across the street, which is pretty comparable, sold for 420, you know, things like that. And, and it'll provide that for you. But you're gonna have your fingers at all the sales. I think what he's asking is, can, I didn't look at this yet, but can you set the time parameter so we can see the sales that you used. I set the time parameter and all the sales right. from 2016 to 2018 are gonna be loaded. All the sales. All the sales. Yeah, but there's Not current the sales too, right? right? You, in fact, keep in mind, you cannot use current sales. Right. No, but the spatialist filter out current sales and you've only populated yep. the 24 Sp months. Spatialist, so Comper will only have the 24 okay. month sales. Okay, yeah, that's what yep, that's it. Now, there will be sales, the current sales on uh, my community, but in Comper is the 24 month. So, uh, how is the neighborhood determined? How do you map out what neighborhood? Or That's another very good question. So, how we do it in the assessor's office is we got you know over 20 economic areas, and we work our way from the south up. Security Whitefield Fountain is called Economic Area Number One, and then Broadmoor working on our way up Economic Area Number Two, Black Forest Economic Area Number Twenty. So we break things down into economic areas, then we look into the subdivision level and go into the neighborhood level, where you cannot compare Security Wide Field Fountain to Broadmoor, which is right across the street from, you know, 115. Two totally different areas. But we break the neighborhoods down, um, and they're not entirely based on MLS. You know, because a lot of the real estate community will sit there and say, 
you know, in the MLS neighborhood is this, we have completely, well, I would say 80% of our neighborhoods are MLS, but not all of them are. And you would sit there and be able to see that, you know, on the map and things like that. Property tools? Giant. Giant. <laughs> yeah. Why you say it's not? Yes, ma'am. Are properties considered exempt for people that are over 65 that have lived there for 10 years? That is a very mm -hmm. good question. In fact, we had that question come up. So there is actually a program called the Senior Homestead Exemption Program and also the Disabled Veteran Exemption Program. And so they're not exempt. However, their taxes are reduced by a percent. So for the senior homestead exemption, you have to be 65, eight, 65 years of age or older and live in the home for more than 10 years. And so what happens is, is basically you get a 50% reduction. Let's say the market value of your home is $200,000, you're only taxed on $100,000. So your taxes are basically cut in half. The disabled veteran basically is through the VA, if the veteran is deemed 100% disabled, is they get the same benefit they just have to be owner of record as of january 1 and they don't have to wait that 10 years now i had a discussion as i walked in here you know a couple minutes before six is i am working on legislation uh with senator gardner and terry carver is i feel as your assessor is our senior homestead exemption has taken away one of the property rights of our seniors which is buying and selling property weekly i make conversations with our seniors who will not sell their home and get out of their four bedroom, three bath home because they will lose their exemption. They will lose that benefit and they gotta start that 10 year clock all over. Uh, we have attempted before to basically remove the 10 year requirement that has failed at the legislature multiple times. Um, we basically have failed as well of having a, a one time portability where you just move it that has failed and the reason why is because the state is concerned about the fiscal note associated with that so we have basically looked at you can only eat this elephant one bite at a time and, and some of the things that i have learned in my 21 years in the assessor's office and listening to our seniors is many of our seniors are moving down from summit county park county from the mountains coming to lower altitude because uh, they just can't take you know the altitude or they're moving uh, to be closer to the VA clinic or the dialysis center or being closer to their primary care physician, or they can no longer climb the stairs. They have fake knees, fake hips, and they have made their main floor their bedroom. I have seen this many times, and those in the real estate community, if you're a broker or an appraiser, you walk into these homes and you look at you know a, a, a bed in the living room because they can no longer go up and down the stairs. <laughs> so the idea, and so far, we've got bipartisan support, and I'm very hopeful, uh, fingers crossed, is where we can incorporate the Medical Portability Act. What that means is if a senior moves due to a medical condition, we as the, I as the assessor can move that exemption from the current residence to their new residence one time, and they don't have to wait that 10 years or anything like that, and I feel that's the right thing to do. When that property then is sold, are those taxes paid back out of the sale price then? No. So let's say you're in the senior homestead exemption and you sell the property to me in June. So we, it will not go back, and I, I'm not in the senior homestead exemption, that property will not go on to the tax rolls as 100% taxable till January 1 of that following year. So, so, so how does that property have to be held? In so tenancy or can it be family trust or no? In fact, just basically, if you just want you know joint tenants in common, so um, as long as the person's a resident of the house, right. right? As long as the individual who is applying is on title and, or in a trust or anything like that. So you know, if you had it in a trust, you could sit there and say, "I'm the one that's applying. Here's the trust." Right. Things like that. Absolutely. But the money is never paid back. The money is backfilled by the state of Colorado. That's backfilled to the entities that are due those monies. And this is the reason why they, the concern with the fiscal note. Um, I disagree with a lot of our elected officials at the state because I don't think they put enough emphasis on our seniors. 
And the concern that I have now is when you're looking at property values and taxes going up, is values are going up, taxes are going up, utilities are going up, uh, food's going up, a number of things. But what's not going up for seniors, which is like my mom and dad, is their income. And they are the ones going payday to payday to payday. And so this is a, a benefit that I feel is more important now than ever before. And I will share with you is the legislature actually attempted two weeks ago to get rid of the senior homestead exemption. They wanted to zero it out and turn it into an income tax. So I, I will be more than willing to debate with folks um, any time about that. I'm not a fan of it because many of our seniors, um, they don't file an income tax return. They don't make that amount, but they're in the senior homestead exemption. So they possibly could lose that benefit entirely. And what will happen is, okay, you're getting a break on the income tax piece, but now your property taxes are going way up. Um, I actually sent an email out, and I don't want to sound cocky because that's not the way I am, but when I ran for office back in uh, 2014, when you all were, you blessed me with the opportunity to be your assessor, one of my main priorities as, as assessor was to ensure fair and equitable assessments in the county and to ensure that uh, the senior homestead and disabled veteran exemption maintained a priority here in El Paso County. Today, we got 26,000 folks in the senior homestead exemption here in El Paso County. We have as many folks in the senior homestead exemption as some counties have total population. It's more than Teller County. So we got a major voice, but what I want to share with you is I sent an email out to all the elected officials, House District representatives, and state senators in El Paso County, and basically shared with them that I'm not a fan of the income tax piece. And I'll share with you three reasons why. One is, I'm concerned that not everybody's going to get the benefit if they're not filing an income tax return and their property taxes are going to go up. That concerns me. The other concern is, is I, I do not like it when government tries to go behind the voter. Keep in mind, the senior homes, the homestead um, exemption is a constitutional amendment that was voted in by we, the voters, in 2000, and it was enacted in 2002. So that's when it got put into place. We, the voters, are the ones that enacted it. Part of that is, is the legislature reviews it annually. They, they can sit there and say, we're going to fund it or not fund it. And there's been some years where they have not funded the senior homestead exemption. The proposal was, we're not going to talk to the voters. We're just not going to fund it. And we're just basically going to put it to the side, and we're going to incorporate the income tax piece. To me, that is backdooring the voter. If you want to change or amend or anything else in your homestead exemption, per our Constitution, you need to take it to the voters. Let them decide on it. Um, you know, the other fact is, I also told them, is the sponsors and co-sponsors, is I was willing to mail out 26,000 letters with their name and number on it. And I heard that didn't go over well up the couch. <laughs> but um, I feel our seniors need to be ed educated on that. They have a voice. And the, spon the, the Senate sponsors and the representative sponsors, I was prepared, if it made it past that committee, was I was going to mail out over 26,000 letters with their name and contact number on there so our seniors could contact them. But it, it, it is a major priority in my office. You, you had mentioned that the, uh, the uh, exemption uh, is, is re reimbursed to do that doesn't go through your office. It does not. It goes through the, the county treasurer. County treasurer. Yes, it does. Yes, sir. On the, in the event of the change that uh, change from, for example, vacant land to residential, and that happens in mid-year, is that prorated, or does it? Is it? Is the rate in effect at the date of taxation? January. As of January 1st. So January 1st is our assessment date in the state of Colorado. So what was the use of the property as of January 1? So if, if it was at commercial rate, then yeah, you're going to be paying you know the commercial rate for the entire year. Um, and then we will pick up the, the residential rate the next following year. But it's, what is the use and basically the status of the property as of January 1st? Residence is completed and occupied. You said once a show gets married, what is it? 
So once, yeah, once there's a backhoe, shovel goes in, and they're pouring a foundation, and a permit is pulled through the Pikes Peak Regional Building, we, we put it into a uh, residential rate. Yes, sir. Well, on the senior homestead, yeah, I got it, thank you. Um, notices of, about it came out with the property tax, so yes. if you look yeah. at your property tax notice, there was a second sheet in there of a, a green yellow paper. Or, yeah, yeah, green yellow. Yes. And it was there at the end of the fill it out and every yeah. for it. In fact, yeah. Mark is so kind where I work with our treasurer, Mark Laudeman, where I put that flyer in there. And it basically yeah. on one side is the senior property tax exemption and disabled veteran, and on the back side is the property tax deferral program. And that's run through his office. But a lot of folks don't like the tax deferral program because basically what happens is the state puts a lien on your property. And you don't pay your property taxes until you sell the property and the taxes are paid back out of um, at closing. And the other, I, it was my, it's my memory that Tabor is, is, is increases in Tabor are both inflation and growth within the district. So yes. as we look at this district and District 20, and the massive growth that's going on here, the growth that's going on up in Lewis Palmer and that sort of thing, the, the growth within the district plus inflation are what allow the table levels to go up within that district. But at the same time, and you're absolutely right, 100% correct, but at the same time, there are times like now where your property values may be going up more yeah. than yeah. what growth and inflation are. Right. Yep. But you are 100% correct. I saw it. Yes, sir. Uh, properties that are converted into rentals. They're, they're still considered 7.15%. They are. So the question was, if properties are converted into rentals, are they con still considered 7.15 residential properties? They are if they're more than 30 days. So, you know, like bed and breakfasts, we sit there and they're valued at a commercial where they can be mixed use. The big topic right now is VRBOs. And you guys have probably heard that through the city of Colorado Springs, things like that in regards to how to take care of VRBOs. I am extremely concerned with VRBOs, which they should be taxed at commercial, valued at commercial. But the there concern is. I have as the assessor is this, is once I change it from residential to commercial, a lender, VA, or FHA can call the note. Because what happens is, is the lender will sit there and go, we lent on this being your primary residence, not a commercial property. <clears throat> the concern I have with that is we have a lot in the military community who buy a house, they get stationed, or they go overseas to Afghanistan, you know, things like that, and they turn it over to a property manager, or turn it into VRBO, it becomes commercial. The other thing is it could be in violation of the HOA covenants. Yeah. So there's just a number of things, and, um, and that's got, just got to work through the state and stuff like that. But. So how many, how many times in a year does a person have to, you know, do a VRBO and cancel the residential, uh, you know, status? It's what it, is, what it is as of January 1st. But the concern I have there is how in the world did you find those yeah, things? That's, you know, I would have a full-time staff member surfing the internet all day long just trying to locate those things. Well, they're supposed to pay the city sales tax. That's okay. There are some staff that are requiring you to register yep. your home with your VRBO. So that they have but it looks like I'm getting a nod. Yeah. But you know, folks, again, I hope the goal tonight was coming out, explaining what the assessor does, and I am extremely hopeful you guys walk out more educated than when you walked in. And really the goal was is to hopefully alleviate a little bit of the sticker shock um, when we mail out the notices of value that are coming out. Um, but you know, and again, if you have neighbors, you know, you talk to them, you want to share with them the PowerPoint, or if you want me to email a PowerPoint, you know, you want to share it with your HOA, I'm more than happy to do that. Or if you want to put a meeting together, I'm more than happy to come out and talk to your HOA and things like that. You know, or come down to Hillside and you know, the community center, you know, things like that. I'm more than happy to come talk to folks. Steve, I think there's a lack of some of this knowledge. I hate to say it in the real estate. I think there's a lack of some of this knowledge in the real estate area for some absolutely absolutely I'd be more than happy to but folks again thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule
come out and visit with us. So thank you. If you haven't signed the